Hi everyone, welcome to our final podcast of the week where it's just Jack and I talking about our favorite, one of our favorite insects, which is moths and butterflies. So hello, Jack. <laughs> hello, Yana. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great, thank you. A little sad that insect week's almost finished, but what can you do? Very, very sad. You know, we've been organizing so much and seeing everybody interact with all the posts and I'm just like, oh my God, it's all, it's all over. So it's crazy how it's gone by so quickly. At least we're ending on a high with butterflies. I know, I know, it's good, it's good. So um, I was just wondering, like, start off, what would you say out of all the local species is your favourite butterfly? Oh, my favourite butterfly, I would definitely say, is the, the common blue butterfly, Polyomatus icarus. I, I just really like the coloration of it, and they're such a small butterfly, and you very rarely see them around Aberdeen, based on my knowledge at least. So yeah. whenever I see one, it's always a, a little treat of the day, I suppose. I've actually, I'm, I've never seen one before. Um, I, I thought I saw one when I was small, but you know, when they, when they close up, the blue color isn't as well seen. It's only when they're flapping, you get that kind of flash of blue. So. Um, yeah, they look quite different when the wings are closed. They've got the almost like orange spots on the wings and the sort of brown coloration. Yeah, yeah. So if if I have seen one, maybe maybe it was like resting on a, a piece of grass or something. Yeah. No, my my favorite's probably the peacock butterfly that that we have. Like it's basically it's so common here, um, and it's got that purple coloration. You know the two big spots that scare away birds and other predators because it looks like two big eyes <laughs> coming at you. So that's that's probably my favorite one. Moth species. What would you say? Is your favorite? Oh, I'm, I'm tied between two moth species. Um, my, my original favorite moth was the six spot burnet. They're sort of like the black coloration, almost mm -hmm. almost like a navy sort of blue as well when the light hits them. Yeah. And they've got the fantastic, obviously, the, the red spots, hence the name, the spotted burnet. But um, lately I've actually been doing a lot of moth trapping in my, my free time. And obviously due to lockdown, there's not much you can really be doing. Mm -hmm. So um, I've saw the, the brimstone moth for the first time and obviously when it's quite dark at night and you're seeing all these grey and brown mm -hmm. moths, seeing a flash of yellow is quite exciting. So yeah, probably the brimstone is my favourite at the moment. Oh my gosh, you're ticking off like all the ones on my list that I want to see brimstone. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> yeah, we'll have to come moth trapping sometime. Yes, yeah, definitely. Because like, yeah, brimstone, that's, that's like, both the moth examples you've given, they're like, butterflies and moths generally we make that distinction of oh, butterflies are brightly colored moths are dull colored and mm -hmm. you know, clearly that's that's not the case because as as you've shown like brimstone's such a bright yellow color Cin cinnabar moth that's another one bright red and black garden tiger moth they're, they're all so pretty so that's definitely not the way to tell moths and butterflies apart um i'm trying to think what What's the other ways of telling moths and butterflies apart? It's um, it's quite, well, it's quite the, difficult in general. Yeah, generally they would say that an easy distinction is that moths are night flyers, whereas the butterflies are day flyers. But of course, that's not the case at all. I mean, certain species like the Madagascar and sunset moth, um, which is also an incredibly beautiful moth, all the different colours. Um, it's it's a day flying species, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of any off the top of my head, but you do get night flying butterfly species as well, or at least late, later flying than some other of the more common butterflies you see. Yeah. So you can't really use that as a definitive way of saying if it's a butterfly or a moth. Well, that, that's the thing. I think um, even if you go to Butterfly Conservation's website and you look up how yeah. can I tell the difference between butterflies and moths, they, they basically say you just have to check the species because there are so many exceptions to the rules that we have. You know, moths have very feathery antennae, but butterflies also have them in, sometimes in certain species. There's also the way that butterflies hold their wings. I don't know if you've, you've noticed that lots of the times butterflies will, like we said, keep their wings closed, but moths generally leave them quite flat, open. Yeah, it's similar to the, the dragonfly and the damselfly example that we had in the, um, the quiz on Wednesday, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a similar distinction. But uh, you go back to the, the antenna for a moment as well. Mm -hmm. Even that's not a good way because, especially with the moths, the males will have really large sort of feathery antenna to detect chemical yeah. cues from the females, you know, the pheromones, whereas the females don't need that because they're not looking for the male. It's the, it's the other way around. So their antenna is often very thin and sort of from just like single fibre. 
Almost. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And um, going back to the wing distinction, again, there's like certain moths that actually hold their wings. I can't remember the species off the top of my head, but they also hold their ver wings vertically, just like butterflies. So basically, I think that the best way to tell them apart is just look, check the species, definitely go double check, make sure, um, because you otherwise you, you won't be able to, to tell. Um, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're definitely going to have to look up the species, but speaking again of species, what about some of the, the ones that we don't find here in the northeast? What's some of your favourite exotic species of moth and butterfly? Oh my gosh, well, I, I love honestly all the exotic species. There's so many different types, but if I, if I was like hard pressed, I'd say Luna moth is my absolute top um, moth species. And butterfly wise, probably the monarch butterfly, which is, uh, you know, a classic. Everyone knows the monarch butterfly. It's used in most posters and things. Um, but the going back to the Luna moth, they've got these really like thin elongated tails at the ends of their wings. And what they found is that these tails are basically used uh, while they're flying to flutter and deter bats. So when bats send out their echolocation to try and catch these moths they instead get like a wave of uh, acoustic signal from the moths tails and take a chomp of the tails rather than their main body parts so the tails get bitten but the the body gets left behind gets saved so i thought i thought that's quite cool um, it's, it's yeah. amazing a lot of the the adaptations that moths have to essentially repel bats you know you've got the lunar moth tails which mm -hmm. scramble the signal effectively but you've also got uh, what is it one of the tiger moths, correct me if I'm wrong here, yeah, no, no. that um, essentially shouts back at the bat. So when the bat echolocates, the moth will make a noise mm -hmm. in response and that throws off the bat's echolocation as well. Well, yeah, yeah. exactly. We, we had this in our acute fact sheet. I don't know if you remember, but same again, the garden tiger moth actually dives in response to the bat coming. So if it, if it senses its frequency, um, being like because it uses a slight version of echolocation itself it will dive before the bat bat dives towards it so that yeah it's quite cool how many defense mechanisms they have sorry I forgot to ask you what's your favorite exotic moth and butterfly uh, the moth um, I'm not too sure if it's an agreed common name it's got a latin name but I th think generally it's called Morgan sphinx moth and I think, if I remember rightly, it's endemic to Madagascar. And the reason that I'm really a fan of that moth is because Charles Darwin actually discovered the plant that the moth has almost like a mutualistic relationship with before, before he, or anyone else, I should say, discovered the moth. And the plant has a really long tube and its nectar stores are right at the bottom. So other pollinating insects can't get into the tube. Yeah. And Darwin hypothesized that there has to be some sort of insect, or in this case a moth, with a very long proboscis that allows it to reach the very bottom to get to these nectar stores and of course pollinate the plant in the process. Yeah. And a good few years later the, the moth was discovered. And if you look it up, if you look up Morgan Sphinx moth, you'll see just how long the proboscis is. It's comically large almost. That's amazing that but, um, yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. And if I had to say my favorite exotic butterfly, they're called the orange oak leaf or alternatively the dead leaf. And they're an incredibly beautiful butterfly. They've got almost like a blue and orange colored wing. And when they fold their wings closed, they do look exactly like a dead leaf. And of course that allows them to blend in and camouflage from predators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly, again, it's like the common blue, you know, they're hiding such bright colours. They're so dark brown on the outside and then when they open up it's just this absolutely amazing blue and orange. I, I love them too. Yeah, <laughs> they're amazing. They're fantastic, definitely. Yeah. Uh -huh. they're just so cool. Um, going back to, sorry, if I can ban a bit, bamboo on a bit more about um, the monarch butterflies. The reason I love them so much is because they migrate, um, well, the, their migration for start has been on my bucket list for years. And they basically migrate all the way from Canada to Mexico for the winter. That's over about 3,000 miles. And um, just, just to go to sleep over the winter time. So I think that, that whole travel is just amazing for such a little insect. <laughs> so that's, that's the other reason why I, I love them so much, aside from the fact that they're, they're so beautiful. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're, they're like the butterfly, almost the classic orange butterfly. Yeah. But, uh... <laughs> I was wondering, they do the incredibly long migrations. Do you know if any of the, the UK species similarly undergo very long migrations? 
Um, so I'm not sure about the exact UK species that that go undergo the migration, but I do know that there are certain UK species, and lots of people I think don't realise this. Lots of uh, well, not lots, but quite a few UK species hibernate just like the monarch butterfly does. Um, perhaps not in such large uh, groups, but if you happen to see a butterfly that looks maybe slightly dead inside your garage or shed or somewhere a bit cooler, then it's probably, um, and if it's autumn or wintertime, it's probably hibernating rather than um, playing possum. So the best thing to do is, is leave it there because it, if you try and move it, um, it's most likely to wake up and then it won't be able to get back to sleep in time for when the flowers bloom. So yeah, um, I'm again, yeah, not, not too sure about the exact species about migration, but I know definitely hibernation is an important thing for UK butterflies, especially the peacock and small tortoise shell. I don't know about hibernation wise, but I remember last year, actually, I think it was last year, I'm all muddled with my times, <laughs> but um, we had the massive influx of painted ladies to the United mm. Kingdom. And that was that was actually the first time in my life, if I remember, that I saw a painted lady. And I, you know, within weeks, I'd seen my first one. Yeah. I saw must have been about a hundred of them feeding on a hedgerow in the area that I stay. Oh, and it's quite, you know, it's, it's not a very remote area. So this was in, in amongst flats and things. Mm -hmm. We had all these butterflies feeding on a hedge, and it was absolutely spectacular. I, I just can imagine that. I I remember my excitement last year actually. Um, because I forgot to mention my favourite local moth, which I only discovered last year, was the hummingbird hawk moth. And if you see it, it looks, again, this is bird related, it looks just like a bird the way it flies, hummingbird. And I remember um, there's a buddleia across from my house, a huge buddleia bush. I thought I thought I, I was seeing, I was like, what is a hummingbird doing in Scotland? And then I was like, wow, wow, like this is, you know, I found a new species or something. And then I was like, oh, wait, oh my God, it's a moth. And um, yeah, it's just the way it flies and the way it looks is just incredible. incredible. Yeah, I love them so much. Um, it just shows that moths, you know, I think moths get a bad rep in uh, comparison to butterflies. They are actually really cool. Oh yeah, they're just as fantastic and as equally useful. You know, a lot of them pollinate plants just the same as butterflies. So we definitely mm -hmm. need them, even though we don't always see them because they're out at night. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I think um, if you get the chance to trap moths like Jack to anyone listening, you should definitely go for it because there were just some absolutely fabulous moths out there. Um, perhaps not as beautiful as some of the ones you get in slightly hotter countries like the Atlas moth, which is just that's the the world's largest moth and that's that's insane but there's still things like the brimstone and the cinnabar that that still are, are equally beautiful so definitely give it a go if you get the chance of course not to mention all the hawk moths we have mm -hmm. in the uk you know the poplar the privet the the elephant hawk all of them are very very beautiful insects oh yeah the elephant hawk moth that pink and green is just actually probably outweighs the looks of some of some of the butterfly species here it's just so pretty and so fluffy yeah i love them <laughs> so almost that's... almost synthetic looking with how vibrant the colors are yeah yeah and um if we were to kind of if we wanted to get like a closer look at butterflies i'm not a big fan of handling butterflies because they're so fragile i've um given it a go when I've been on a school field trip where there was an expert on hand, but I know, Jack, that you have a bit more experience with this. So could you describe in a bit more detail for us how we would hold a butterfly or moth? Uh, yeah, sure. And I mean, uh, as you've mentioned, I would generally advise against, you know, holding butterflies and grabbing butterflies or moths because they are incredibly delicate and you can damage the wings. And of course, the scales on the wings as well are very important. I believe is it repelling heat that some of the scales are important yeah, for? Yeah, yeah, they, they repel yeah, yeah. Um, They're also, the, the colour on them as well is used for mating season because the males have obviously these bright colours to attract the females um, and it also affects their, their mode of flight. So the scales are incredibly important and one of the reasons why their wings are so delicate, yeah. Well, that's it. So for, for all of those reasons, you should maybe generally be careful if, if you are going to hold them at all. But the easiest way sort of to generally hold them is um, we're getting something like a butterfly net to start with. And they're very soft, so you can you can scoop up the butterfly or the moth without causing any harm. And then once the butterfly or the moth is in, in your net, you can gently hold um, the sides of the body just under the wings. 
or alternatively, you can very, very gently hold the base of the wings and press them together, not actually applying force. And that should allow you to have a look at the butterfly. We, we have a picture here. The picture will do it much more justice than I'm doing. <laughs> uh, as, as long as you hold it in that sort of that way, you mm. should be able to uh, have a look at the inside without causing any harm. Yeah, that's the thing. Even the one time I, I used that method, it's you have to be so, so careful. So it's generally... Um, rec recommended against but I guess if you've found a butterfly that's injured or something along those similar kind of desperate lines then, then yeah maybe maybe give it a go with with extreme caution my um, way of holding a butterfly if I if I really would like a closer look but I don't want to disturb the animal usually is to try and gently coax it onto a leaf um, and that's that's just generally offering out um, a leaf with a flower on it, maybe so that it crawls on, and then you can hold it up to get a closer look. But um, yeah, otherwise, otherwise they're just yeah, they're so fragile. Just just avoid it. You gotta be very careful. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time, you know, patience truly is a virtue with animals like butterflies, because mm -hmm. from my experience, anyway, certain species such as the red admiral, mm -hmm. um, if it's resting somewhere or feeding on a specific plant. Once you disturb it, it will fly away, but then almost do a loop and come back. So if you see one feeding in a certain area and then you go over and it flies off and you just wait and be patient, sometimes it will just come back and then you can get quite a good look at it once it realizes you're not going to do it any harm, of course. That, that is quite true. They do normally kind of return back to the spot. I have seen uh, a couple of times when I'm walking on a pathway, even the butterflies almost following along, especially if you've got brightly colored clothes on. They think you're one, just one giant flower. So <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's normally quite sweet, but then you can never get them to land to get a good photo. It's like, stay still, please. <laughs> I know they're temperamental as anything sometimes. Yeah, yeah, but it's one of the reasons why I love them so much. They're just so unpredictable, like flapping about the place. The thrill of the chase almost. I've spent <laughs> way too many of my afternoons chasing after butterflies and getting yeah. countless strange looks from passers-by, but it's all worth it once you get the photo. No, oh, it is, definitely. Um, I also equally love, though, I mean, we already spoke to Giuliano about it earlier in the week, but the, the caterpillars, there's so many different types of caterpillars, and the way how they look so different from the adults generally is also equally amazing. You know, that's just an, an incredible process, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. It's They looked completely different. And as has been mentioned very briefly in some of our other podcasts, the whole reason for that is so that the adults and the larvae don't compete with one another. And this is true for uh, loads of different insect types that go through a metamorphosis. So that, you know, the dragonflies as well, their larvae live, live underwater. So similarly, the butterflies, the moth, their caterpillars eat all the leaves and you know live sort of in the, the shrubs and the undergrowth and then the adults occupy the sky and feed on nectar and things so they don't compete with one another directly so that, that's advantageous from an evolutionary perspective because you're not going to compete against well essentially your own offspring or other offspring that's closely related to you. But on, honestly I, I think it's such an extreme adaptation just to avoid adult competition because the whole um way that they change you know the metamorphosis within the cocoon is a really extreme process how they turn into soup basically and um they're nothing more than you know a few advanced clusters of cells that then change within the cocoon i just think it's it's a lot just to, to avoid being caught by you know mom or dad so yeah yeah it's it's, it's fantastic and the, the thing like you've mentioned they, they essentially a lot of the caterpillars do turn into like a liquidy soup just mm -hmm. totally break down and then reassemble when they're going undergoing metamorphosis in their cocoons. But um, despite that, they, there's actually been studies done that have proven that the adult butterflies will have this similar memory, sorry, they'll have some of the same memories mm -hmm. that they experienced when they were caterpillars. And the way that they tested that and proved that <laughs> to yeah. the caterpillars, yeah, it's not too pleasant, but they essentially stressed the caterpillars out a little bit and then associated that stress with like a negative stimulus. And then once these caterpillars had metamorphosed into the butterflies, they exposed the same butterflies to that um, stimulus and they reacted negatively. So that shows that they've retained the memory through metamorphosis, through becoming soup, essentially. Yeah, that's the thing. I just think, um, you know, though it's, it's wonderful to have figured out that they can 
they can think inside the cocoon or they, they retain memories. There probably was a nicer way to have gone about it rather than, you know, giving them a little electric shock every time they have a certain smell or noise. Um, perhaps. Yeah. Nice soothing music with some sugar <laughs> water, maybe. <laughs> Just some like lo fi music playing in the background slowly while, they, while they're fed. That would be nice. But um, no, I, I think it, it is incredible how throughout all of that they still manage to somehow remember things, especially when their lifespans, um, except the ones obviously that hibernate for a couple months, their lifespans are, are really short. So um, that that is a lot to take in <laughs> for the short to live. And um, the, the other thing that I also found amazing that, you know, we, we looked at this week and I didn't even realize it was, I, you know, the photos that were donated from Jim Asher, just the differences in structure there were fantastic. It was so beautiful to see. Of the, of the eggs. Yeah, yeah, of the eggs there that he donated in to us to use on the page. I just thought they were so cool. Yeah, there was such variation from, from the very simple ones that just like little droplets on a leaf, essentially, to the... The um the one one of your favorite ones, Liana, that had the the ridges up the side and you know they almost almost looked, resembled something like a barrel cactus. It looked incredible. Yes. Oh my gosh, the red admiral egg was something out of looked like it should have belonged underwater. Honestly, it just looked otherworldly. I just when when um Jim sent us those photos, I was like, oh my god, this is the most amazing <laughs> thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I've certainly never saw a Red Admiral's egg before. And that's, that's one of the things I absolutely adore about insects, that their world is on such a different scale to ours. And if yeah. you don't stop and look, you miss out on so many amazing things like that. So, you yeah. know, and you can access all of that from going out on a walk, you know, through like a park or your garden. That's as simple as that. And you can see incredible things. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, even, you know, we all love butterflies, but that's actually one of the larger insects. There are so many small insects out there that we we don't take time to actually stop and see and are equally as important you know so um mm. i think butterflies is a good place to start if you are <laughs> if you are slightly averse to insects in the beginning anyway um because they, they are equally important they're you know very important bioindicators they also provide food for so many different animals and um generally because the reason that they're such good bioindicators is again because they're so fragile. They're, we need them to see how climate change is affecting everything else. So, yeah. yeah that's it. Without the insects, you know, every, all the other ecosystems and food chains would collapse. Because, mm -hmm. as you know, people such as you know, Xander and Ashley, they've told us insects are the cleanup crew as well. So they recycle so much things back into environments. And without that, you know, there wouldn't be as much nutrients in the soil. And, you know, it'd be a massive knock-on effect, not even just for animals. I mean, you know, plants rely on all of that as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. So it's all it's all interconnected, you know, which is why we really need to pay attention even to the little ones. I think we're maybe running a little bit over time here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, um, we'll stop for now then. But uh, that's, I think, our final podcast for this week. Thank you so much to everyone who tuned in and listened to us rambling to, to different people we really had such so much fun doing this series and we'll have a small closing video on sunday but apart from that that's it for us so thank you again for joining in northeast national insect week and we'll hopefully see you again in 2022 bye look forward to it see you then <laughs>